Welcome to video number two. My name is Virginia Walbit and I'm a professor here in the biology department at Stanford University. And today we're going to talk about color patterns in flowers. And I thought I'd share with you that I've always been fascinated by color patterns and in fact I collect old pictures that illustrate some of the color patterns. And here on my wall directly above my desk is a beautiful pink and white and purple carnation flower. And it illustrates one of several patterns, a kind of candy striping pattern that we'll be talking about in a few minutes. And here's um, another uh, a verbena, and it also has the candy stripe, in this case uh, pink on, on mainly white. So that's kind of a confession <laughs> that I find the, the patterning of color on petals and in flowers. Um, to be ultimately fascinating. And I'd like to explain to you today how some of those patterns actually are formed by the plant. Okay. So here we are looking at an all red camellia. And in many species, the typical flower is one solid color, at least in terms of the petals. But actually growing on the same camellia bush were flowers that looked like this. So here's one that's red and white with some petals that are half red and half white. Here's a flower where about a third of the flower's petals are red and the others are sort of blotchy red and white. So how do plants do that? How can they make multiple colors in one petal and yield either a a random pattern or a very organized pattern. So in order to understand that, we need to look at a couple of pictures. So first off, each plant organ, we look at this leaf, has a proximo or proximal distal axis, kind of the long dimension of the organ. And so we could imagine um, a stripe running down the center of this um, leaf, and in fact, we often see things like that in flowers. So where a proximo-distal axis, here we have a white area on an otherwise purple flower. And so somehow the flower is able to know the central axis from base to tip and is making less pigment along that axis than it does in the other parts of the flower. Another really common pattern is to have broad white or colored tips and the opposite at the base of each petal. So here, instead of having the center of the proximal distal axis being a different color, here the upper, the proximal part, um, and the distal part are different colors. So the plant is able, just like we are, to measure up and down and right and left so it can tell the difference between tip and base, and it can divide a petal in half or into thirds. So these are actually the most common patterns in nature, are ones in which you have a central stripe, or at least a different color in the center than the edges, or between the base and the tip of a petal. Other common patterns are ones that are much more complicated, like this orchid flower, where there are actually two different colors of pigment in this flower. There's a kind of reddish-brown pigment, and including this complicated set of dots, and then a true pink. So the plant is able to make uh, two different colors of anthocyanin, depending on where you are in the flower. And in this rose, we see that the edges of the petals are bright pink, but the bulk of the petal is white. And then and finally, in this picture, which is uh, a bird of paradise, which happens to be the city flower for Los Angeles, California, which is where I was born. I love the birds of paradise. We see that each part of the flower is a different color. So we have orange parts, purple parts, and red parts. So depending on the kind of organ in the flower, we have a different color. Now, one of the really um, nifty kinds of patterns um, is called picotee. That's a French word 
um, that means points. And the rose that I showed you is a kind of Piketty pattern where we have a brightly colored edge and a white um, petal. We have an actually better um, example of that in these carnations. So I'll just pick off one of these Piketty carnation flowers. So here, um, if we can zoom in, we'll see that the edges of each petal are really bright, bright pink, whereas the bulk of the petal is a kind of uh, golden yellow color. So that's probably just chalcone pigment, and the petal edges have the anthocyanin. So for years, people wondered, how do you get, or how does the plant make this really nifty Piketty pattern? And if you look closely, you'll see that it, the edge effect isn't perfect. It's not like an artist drew a line on each petal. There are little streaks of purple that extend down some of the petals more towards the center. So it's not just edge, it's something else. And the something else is pretty easy once you know the trick. If you think about how a, how a um, flower emerges, so this is a fully open carnation, and this is a carnation a couple of days earlier, and you can see that the tips of the petals have emerged from the sepals. But if we look one step before that, we have just a bud. But if we kind of mess around with this bud, you can see that it's already starting to crack open. So if we imagine that the next day, the sepals pull back just a little bit more, the edges of the petals that are inside right here where the sepals pull back first, they're going to get light. And it turns out that the Piketty pattern is generated by, in effect, light leaks onto the developing petals. And what's interesting is that all the cells of the petal are competent to make anthocyanin, but there's a very narrow window of time in which light can stimulate the petal tissue to make the anthocyanin pigment. This narrow bit of time is called the pheno-critical period. So pheno, like phenotype, P-H-E-N-O, means property. And then critical means, just like plain English, it means the only period of time when they're responsive. So this purple or red phenotype, the edge anthocyanin, can only be made in a narrow period of time when immature petals are exposed to light. So this suggests, that like a super simple experiment, that if we take the sepals off artificially, we should be able to get this otherwise yellowish flower to produce anthocyanin throughout the petals. And in fact, that's an experiment that we do in our plant genetics class, and it works. So we can overcome nature by peeling the sepals back and exposing the petals to light. In fact, they're most responsive to ultraviolet radiation and will get nice strong purple color in this particular variety, Piketty variety of carnation. So now the next time that you're out on a walk, I'd like you to notice how often you see a Piketty pattern. It is a very, very common um, decoration on a lot of um, plant species. And I brought a few more pictures. Piketty patterns are highly regular. That is, most flowers will look very similar to each other until you get really close. And then you can see that there's always, in this particular rhododendron, a nice dark pink edge but the thickness of the edge and where there are little streaks where there were light leaks into the main part of the petal will differ petal by petal. So from a distance, it looks like a highly regular pattern, but as you get closer to the flower, you can see that there's variation. And that's also true in this species, which has an interesting, what's called reverse Piketty pattern. Here, the body of the petals are brightly colored but the tips are very pale. And in this case, um, early photons, early exposure to light, actually inhibited the biosynthesis of anthocyanin pigment.
giving us this reverse Picatee pattern with a pale edge and a dark petal body. So Picatee refers not just to dark edge, it means that there's a distinctive edge effect on the petals. And um, again, I encourage you when you're out in a garden or when you're shopping for flowers to notice how often the Picatee pattern occurs.